Hello, assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Welcome to another program of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. As I always say when I start this program, you know, in the introduction, it's uh, my favorite part of the week. Uh, part when I actually personally as well get the chance to unwind and to stop, stop, you know, being a part of the rat race. Everything is going uh, ahead in such sort of, you know, fast speed. So this is a time when I get the chance to actually, you know, slow down, think about things, and it is chicken soup for the soul. Today we have a fantastic topic, and we're going to talk about literature and the environment. We're going to talk about, you know, the integral part that man has with his physical environment and the impact it's made on writings, poetry, prose as well. So for today's uh, program, I'm very happy to introduce our guest, Dr. Munaza Yaqub, Associate Professor for the Department of English at the International Islamic University, Islamabad. Thank you very much, Dr. Munaza, for you. joining us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this program because uh, this is the topic which is so close to my heart. Not only it's my research interest mm. as a teacher, as a researcher, but it's very close to my heart. And I was really looking forward to some forum where mm. people like you who are themselves are creative writers are, are engaged uh, in the discussions and topics like literature and environment that I should be there and I should be talking about that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to you and the other people who have invited me and given me this opportunity to be here today. It's, it's our pleasure. Mm -hmm. you. And you know, uh, we, we are blessed to have such people amongst us. So many people who are quietly working behind the scenes, making a difference to Pakistan's intelligentsia, to the intellectuals. And, you know, I find this, uh, I find it, you know, a bit sad as well, that the more skilled a person is, the more sort of uh, uh, of a deep thinker they are, the quieter they are. Yes. And they, you know, you need, we need to bring them into the limelight. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this program. So thank you very much for, you know, coming here. And we're going to talk about a topic, as you said, is very close to your heart. Tell us, uh, Dr. Minaza, why is it so important to talk about the environment and um, the relationship that man has with it? I think, uh, uh, I don't know why we always uh, lag behind where, when, uh, when it's the matter of some important issues. I don't want Pakistan or Pakistani representation should be that we are not concerned with the environment. Mm. I think environmental issues are nowadays are global issues. Mm. If people don't know anything else about environment, but at least even a common man living in every society on the globe right now is affected by the climate change. Mm. How drastically the weathers are changing, the ch changes in the seasons, the earthquakes, floods, tsunamis mm. and all that. And particularly the health issues, our, uh, you see, respiratory problems, mm. our uh, diarrhea and so many other physical problems uh, which we are f suffering from right now, they mm. are actually caused by the drastic changes in our environment. Absolutely. So I think that the human beings, they have a very, very close and, uh, and close relationship with the environment, the physical environment which is around us. Mm. It's not that it's just there mm. and we are living and we should be concerned with our material things that I have to earn, I have to make roads, I have to earn my bread and I have to do my job, I have to be in mm. the uh, air conditioner rooms and all that and that's the end no this mm. is not the end mm. it's this is just one dimension of our whole existence our whole life Absolutely. there is a there are so many other dimensions and there are big things which are around us mm. and we have to be mindful about them and that is our physical environment and in, yes and in fact yeah. you know we uh, we are having, we're getting reminders all the time, wake up calls, yes. so as to say, mm -hmm. happening around the world. Now, you know, we're going to go back to this uh, aspect of the conversation as well. First, you know, let's discuss the relationship between literature yes. and environment. Yeah, so I think as a literature person, I won't say I'm a teacher of literature, as a literature person, I think I have, before that I was so mindful of environmental issues in Pakistan and mm -hmm. in the world, I think as a reader, as a literature person, I have always felt one thing that literature has always served as a background to any of our creative effort, particularly literary writings. Mm. It, it's a background and it has been presented in the, 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 as a background through the symbols, metaphors, images to reflect upon 
human nature, whether our reflection, the focus of our reflection or a writer is mm -hmm. human nature, human relationship, society, politics, history, whatever mm -hmm. is the focus of the, the writer, nature has always provided him or her a good background, mm -hmm. good images, mm -hmm. metaphors, very appropriate, good I mean very appropriate through which it's easy for them to express mm. their moods their and to reflect upon mm. the issues. So I have been reading, you see, classical poets and even our, uh, uh, particularly whenever we talk about nature, our mind goes directly to uh, the romantic poets. So being a student and of English literature, mm. the first name which occurs to everyone is Wordsworth exactly. and Coleridge, that romantic movement mm -hmm. and similarly romantic movement in Urdu literature. Mm. So if you read them, that how intrins intrinsic relationship a man and the soul of man has with the nature. Yes. You cannot have uh, inner calmness, you cannot have a spiritual satisfaction, you cannot have contentment. Mm. Even as a human being, you are not psychologically a sane person mm. if you are not mindful of the beauty which is spread around you mm. and the beauteous effect it is giving to you. Mm. So um, if we have time, we can read something from Wordsworth. Definitely, just to see definitely, that, please, uh, yes. Yes, that how, I, I have a little extract from his very, very famous prelude, mm. the book one, mm. in which he is uh, uh, addressing the river Derwent. Mm. He says that the fairest of all rivers loved to blend his murmur with my nurse's song and from his alder shades and rocky falls and from his fords and shallows sent a voice that flowed along my dreams. For this didst thou, O Derwent, traveling over the green plains near my sweet birth place, didst thou, beauteous stream, make ceaseless music through the night and day, which with its steady cadence tempering our human waywardness, mm. composed my thoughts to more than infant softness, giving me among the fretful dwelling of mankind, a knowledge, a dim earnest of the calm that nature breathes amongst the hills and the groves. Mm. So see that it's not a person who is, maybe it's very subjective, a person talking about his personal feeling mm. that how the river has mm. actually tempered mm. his human mm. waywardness and he could realize that nature breathes amongst the hills and the mountains and hills and the groves. Fantastic imagery. Yes. Fantastic Look at the imagery. imagery. Look at the imagery. It's Not only the objects of nature are being described, mm. but how the human feelings are connected with them. Exactly. And I think that is the uh, the only uh, the best the, the only feature mm. or the function of literature mm. that which which connects the nature with the mm. human uh, human being so well. Absolutely. When we talk about poetic technique. We talk about imagery, we talk mm. about metaphors, alliteration, various other techniques used by poets. So much of it is dependent on nature. Yes. So much of it is dependent on describing the environment that they're living in. Yes. So, uh, you see, this is the important thing because uh, the issue which I would like to talk and most of us would like to talk these days, that when environmental disaster or environmental hazardous, uh, uh, environmentally hazardous uh, things are affecting human life and human health so much. Mm. So what are, the, what are the steps to be taken off? How we could become mindful of all that? Mm. So there are big things which are going on, like we have Ministry of Climate Change, we have environmental protection agencies. There are so many other mm. uh, organizations world over which are working on the national level, international level. Mm. So many material resources are involved in that to let them uh, keep functioning and all that. Let them do their job. Perhaps mm. this is their job and it must be done that way. Mm. But along with that, there is another job which we all human being owe as a, our, we see gratefulness to the nature that we should do, the way we are talking about it. And I think literature is the best source mm. which can engage us in this meaningful conversation about the existence of nature. Mm. Because as I just read few lines, you yourself are a poet, you write and you see how na na images and the imagery Absolutely. from the nature, it comes naturally to you Absolutely. when you are reflecting upon oh, any yes. phenomenon or you are describing yourself. Yes. So why can't we sit and when we are reading literature, mm. we just highlight these images, mm. we highlight these metaphors, we highlight 
the connection which literature is trying to build between mm. me and you and the other things which are around us. Mm. So exactly. we just become mindful of mm. the presence of nature in literature. Mm. This is a very simple thing mm. for which we don't need a very high scholarship or Absolutely. very big intellectual Absolutely. or a big researchers to do that. Exactly. Very common people, like a common reader of literature. Of and course. I think reading literature is a one of the uh, very, very common feature of mm. our culture. We read you know, literature. Exactly. We and enjoy. As, exactly. Yeah. And as you're saying, you know, uh, so many times you've felt something. So many times you've, you've, you're perceiving things at subconscious and conscious level. And many things are being stored into your yes. brain, and you know you know that you've been exposed to something, but you, you're not really sure about the certain feeling that it triggered. And then when you read poetry, what happens is then you make that connection, yes. and you say to yourself, "Oh, I remember this feeling. This is where I was, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, sitting by the stream and seeing the water just ripple by, or watching the breeze pass through the leaves on the tree in autumn, and the feelings that that generates." Yes. It really is something uh, that is spiritually uplifting. Yes. And in fact, so many times when people are over uh, stressed, they're anxious, they are told by medical professionals to get out yes. of the house and go and involve yourself in nature. So it's a therapeutic uh, yes. effect as well. So this is something, this is what I'm saying, that instead mm. of making it a very, very intellectual issues or just uh, placing it inside academia or inside the scholarly talk, Mm. We should make it a talk, of our everyday talk, as you said, mm. that we are recommended to go to nature, to go to hilly areas, mm. to go to peaceful place, mm. to go near the river and mm. have rest for a few days because we need to be out of this noisy cities and all that. Absolutely. So this is a very common thing. Mm. Why the doctors, why the uh, psychologists recommend us to go to the nature? Mm. There must be an uh, inbuilt mm. understanding mm. inside us mm. that it will heal us. So there's so if we accept it heals us. Yeah, there's a huh. need for poetry yes. inside everyone, yes. whether they agree to it or not. Yes, there's a need for literature for everyone. Yeah, the, you see, there are my colleagues who always say that what's the benefit of reading literature? Because mm. this question, after 80s, you see, in the context of globalization, when mm. commercialization of knowledge and industry and management sciences and computer sciences, mm. they reached at the peak. Everybody asked. So what's the point of reading literature? Mm. So with your computers, with your industry, with all this management, okay, you can build, make, you can build the built environments. Mm. You can make the big things, the big mm. buildings. You can go to, uh, you see, Mars, or you can do wonderful aeroplanes. Yes. But ultimately, when you are sick of everything, then where would you go? Mm. Aeroplanes will not give you that, mm. uh, you see, peace. It exactly. will not give you health in your mind. And for so so many you need to go to the trees, back to the nature, back to your real self. Back to your roots. Uh, yes. Because that's so where you're grounded. Yes. So literature and poetry is that. Mm. When mm. you think of going to the river and the hills mm. in order to give peace to yourself mm. and to, to have some, uh, to uh, get back to your real self as a human self, so that is actually you are engaging yourself with literature and poetry. This is mm. this is the job mm. of literature, the aesthetic self and the real self, and can making these spiritual and mindful connection with the things which are not material and not done in the name of advancement as per se. That is so important. Yeah. The word the word that you just used, connection. Yes. It is our disconnect from the things that uh, you know, are, are a part of us that we should be connected with that actually breed discontent. Yes. And it is when a person realizes that the outdoors brings you so much peace that you start questioning yourself. As you said, you know, materialism, how much, and the balance between having uh, you know, nature around you as well, and your environment uh, preserved. Uh, now, if we talk about the West, and we talk about Pakistan as well, materialism and everything is coming from there. But at the same time, we had this conversation before yes. we were recording. They have been able to, you know, preserve their parks. And keep a balance. greenery, the balance. You see, if you're talking about the West, okay, this concept of 
advancement and material progress if we have taken from the West and we want to be a developed, you say, advanced nation. Mm. But development or in the name or sorry, the, the capitalist expansion in mm. the name of the development mm. and the material advancement can never restore human happiness, can never give happiness to man. Absolutely. So if we have taken this model of the progress from the West, why we don't see the other aspect of the West as well? Absolutely. The environmentalist movement, actually it was launched in the West for 50 years or 60 years back mm. when we were even not mindful of that. Mm. We have just started talking about these issues now. Mm. So the environmentalism as a movement back in 1960s, mm. so in America or in the lit other parts of the world, they were actually raising the issue which we are talking today. Right. Okay, we have a right to have material progress. Mm. We have a right to build the industry. Of we course. have right to make the roads and all that. Let's make human beings material happy. But this is a misconception of happiness. Human happiness cannot be associated with the material achievement because there is always an end to it. You reach to that level of satiation of material achievements, mm. and there it is the end. Mm. So, in th if this is the criteria of happiness, mm. why everybody is not happy in the West then, and when they have all these material achievements which we in the global south don't have? And you know, uh, so just, this to is put, and just to emphasize yeah. your point, uh, twenty years ago, twenty-five years ago, children would spend a lot of time outdoors. Yeah playing in parks, sports, and um, close to nature. Now you see uh, children getting less time outdoors, more time indoors with their gadgets. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where you feel that they're missing out on something really they're important. They're missing a lot. Rather, the most important aspect of their existence of on childhood. Earth. And we are doing it here in the third world. They are not doing it. Their children, they are engaged very actively in sports. Mm. They go to their gardens. They have big gardens and the recreation parks in very close by neighborhoods mm. in all the communities in the West. Mm. But we have just, uh, I think, uh, we can't see these parks and the sports grounds and other things and where, pe where the children are invited and attracted to play. As a result, our, we have pushed our children indoors and right. they're all the time with the gadgets mm. which are, mm, I think, uh, mm. is, are very harmful to so not only their physical health mm. but as well as their, their mind as well. Their mind because as that's well. unfiltered. The information they're getting is unfiltered. Okay, so um, tell us, you know, uh, what should we be reading and writing to sort of raise environmental consciousness as well? Yes, th th this is very important because as our field is literature and I said that it, this is very close to all of us and this is, we don't need to spend, uh, we don't need to have material resources to do this mm. thing. People in Pakistan are writing, mm. in Pakistan people are reading literature. Mm. So I think if whatever literature is being written, mm. before we come to your question that what is to be written, Whatever literature is being written by our uh, classical poets or the contemporary poet, even the writer, fiction writers, we just read their text by focusing our attention on the representation of nature mm. in their text. Mm. As we started our conversation today, that all literary texts, in all literary texts, nature is always there. Yes. As a background, as a metaphor, as a symbol, mm. as a reference, as mm. a point. Mm. So we don't need to uh, you see, do something very special. Too. We just have all these books in with us. Yeah. We have all those writings. We have mm. that treasure. We mm. just need to uh, rethink of our reading strategies. Yes. For my personal reading, your personal reading, mm. or when we are teaching in the classes, no matter whatever we are teaching mm. to them, just focus mm. the representation of environment and nature. Mm. That what, how? Because you see, I was reading uh, Robert Frost Birches or some other poem. Perhaps I would have never been mindful that uh, what is the rustling sound of the leaves when we pass through the woodlands. Mm. When you look at the tall trees, birches, how do you feel and how the, when the breeze or the wind passes through them, mm. what is the movement of the trees and how the different shades of the green 
hmm. they intermingle with each other i would have never noticed right the poet made me to notice that mm. because mm. their their magic pen mm. has that magic effect mm. to look at the nature mm. and perceive its beauty and its effect in a very very uh, uncommon way right and that uncommon way and their perception through beautiful words when it is Trans, uh, you see, transferred on the page, exactly. and it comes to me, and so many and that's like a me. jewel there for everyone. So you are actually making us to see the nature, yeah. to observe yeah. it mm. in a very different way. And I think this is a very simple thing which we can do, right? As a reader, mm. and for the writer, as your question was, whosoever are writing, they have been writing about nature just to yeah. be more mindful, mm. mindful of the sense that there will be reader who might be taking some lessons or might be taken might be taking interest in what you are writing mm. so how i could make how my words could make them be more mindful of the environment in which they are living mm. and how they could how my words and my representation could strengthen that connection mm. which the reader have with their physical environment and i think it's not a very hard job and it's not a very difficult job to do. That's it's true. being done. And in fact, you know, when we talk of solace, we talk of comfort, we talk of uh, being somewhere that is soothing. And the eternal quest, every human being is on an eternal quest. We're asking for answers, you know, we're asking questions and yes. we want those answers. We want to know why we're here. We want to know what we're doing. We want to know what it is that we're seeking that element that we have. So um, a poem that I, I have uh, written, and it's um, a bit about you know nature and contentment as well, mm -hmm. a short one. It's not what the tide brings in, but what's left when the roaring waves are called back. Look closely at that silent, glistening shore, for that's reality. And in your nothingness and solitude, and when the drunkenness has finally drowned, you will find everything. Yes, beautiful. So, uh, you know, as you said, it's, it's where you go to find answers. Yes. Nature is, is, is the sort of answer. It's answer and it is a source through which you can find the answers, perhaps. Isn't True. it so? True. It, it's um, the thought-provoking process. Mm -hmm. And um, now, when we're talking about, you know, thought-provoking and everything, tell us about critical thinking and your involvement there. Yes, thank you so much for asking this question and my passion. Uh, critical thinking forum is a, a interdisciplinary forum, predominantly mm. women-centered forum because mm -hmm. uh, it was established by the, uh, I worked with my student, research students, and they were all female students, mm -hmm. and we made a study circle mm -hmm. which we named as critical thinking forum, mm. and for the last, uh, uh, I think since 2011-12, we have been working for the last six, seven years. Mm. We have been working on consciousness raising mm -hmm. of uh, Pakistani women, particularly men as well, mm. on social and academic issues. Right. And we formalized it through our project in 2015 with the, uh, uh, there was an open funding opportunity on American website, Women Empowerment, and we formalized it in 2015. But before that, we have been working on these social academic issues mm. like uh, women oppression, women education, uh, inter uh, cultural harmony, mm. uh, the, the ethnic conflicts tolerance. and the lack of tolerance in mm. our society, mm -hmm. peace and religious extremism. Mm. We have been engaging in dialogues through seminars, tables, lectures, discussions, <laughs> literature and mm. all that. Mm -hmm. But an environment was one of the main objective of critical thinking forum and we have been engaged with it for the, for the last six, seven years. Uh, and I think during that time, my first article which was published, it was in 2009. I was reading Mo Mohsen Hamid's novel, Moth Smoke. And I observed that how beautifully and how artistically he used the nature metaphor f to undermine the capitalist material progress of mm. Pakistan, mm. particularly at the cost of environment, and how that harmful environmental effect and pollution, it is affected human psyche and human health including the human relationship beautifully. Imagine. So I just the wrote a very simple article. And in fact, you have the book. Yes, I have you? the book. Yeah. If you allow me, yes, I may uh, read a few lines yes. from his uh, uh, novel. It's mm. a moth smoke. You see, you just notice it. He says that 
We shake hands and kiss cheeks respectively and I'm off, driving under the hot candle of a shadow casting moon that's bigger and brighter and yellower than it should be. There are no clouds and no wind and there are no stars because of the dust. Hmm. You see, he makes you mindful words there and mm -hmm. similarly, uh, what he says, but you always, but you can always justify killing animals on the grounds that you want to eat them or wear them or that they smell bad, look funny, bother you, threaten you and have the bad luck of being in your way. What about killing humans? Then I leave a few lines. Wearing a sword suit which cost as much as a farmer will make in his lifetime is acceptable. But actually putting his eyeball on a string and letting them dangle above tastefully exposed cleavage is bad form. And then you want deodorants. You know that one in 6.87 million will die from a violent allergic reaction. You shrug and churn the stuff out and some poor fellow suffers a pain in the armpit beyond imagining and dies. Hmm. You see the environmental concern. Exactly. Then if you keep on reading the different pages in the novel, you feel that he is concerned with the pollution, with the noise and with so many other things. The sun is completely blotted out hmm. by a dirty sky. So he, you see, the novel, the set, this novel is set in Lahore city. Hmm. So the pol air pollution, the toxin and this uh, the pollution smoke or the this uh, uh, what what uh, the vehicles emissions and the noise the you see pollution. on each page you will find one or mm. two lines that mm. he's referring to that pollution mm. and then he's again it's subconsciously it's being stored it's being and it's stored. being recognized yes that because me and you anybody who is mm. reading when again and again we read the sun is blotted or oh, there is a dirt or oh, there is a pollution mm. he was sweating badly and his mood was very bad because mm. there was so much heat on the road mm. he was mm. pushing his car mm. and he felt it and then he refers to a person who would like so much air conditioning in the summer that he cannot sleep without taking a blanket mm. and in the winter there is so much heating that he would like to take his clothes off mm. so is it being not mindful what you are doing mm -hmm. and because of the air conditioning in his house what is happening on the road exactly. there was a one character on the road who was sweating profusely because of the extreme heat which he was facing you see these images Again, a paradox paradox uh, yes of the situation uh -huh. and so what he draws man our is attention inflicting upon mm. man so for me it was very interesting to explore that how the external environment which is changing mm. and the way it is affecting the health of the main characters, not the health, but their moral, uh, ethical concerns, the psychological state, the mm. how from a healthy, normal human being, mm. he turned into an addict and a crime because of living in a dark room where there was no electricity and, and he used to think and the, mm. you see, he, he built up a connection. Of course, yes. And it, then it leads us to not something which is good. Mm. So I just started writing on it and mm. uh, when I published it, uh, to my surprise after four years, somebody from outside in the West, Professor S Scott Slovic and his editorial team, they contacted me. They were, we were searching for some name who writes on the environment and literature in Pakistan and we found you. Oh, so why don't you write a chapter for our book volume which was going to be published by them. Uh, and. Uh, then I wrote an article, a book chapter, Environmental Consciousness in Pakistani Literature in, in English. I focused on fiction at that time, not on poetry, because right. that was the scope. And I was very happy to write about that. Mm -hmm. And that writing, why I mentioned that chapter which I wrote, because writing of that chapter actually made me very much conscious of the writers and the work they are writing. Mm -hmm. And then I started reading Uzma Aslam Khan, and I said that, yes, she's the environmentalist writing. Her latest work, Thinner Than Skin, is actually focused on our northern areas, the valleys, the nomad tribes and all that, that how our forestry mm. and our some military camps and some other, um, you see, tourism industry, it is actually destroying those areas. On one hand, we are perhaps making some name in the commercial thing, mm. but on the other hand, we are destroying the uh, indigenous uh, uh, nomadic life mm. and we are 
giving so much harm so we, to know, those glaciers which are only in Pakistan. So what are we achieving yeah. at what expense? Yes. You know, and, and, and as you said, you know, it's all about balance. So anyway, we'll get back to this conversation. Don't change the channel. We'll be right back after this break. Hello, welcome back. Yes, we're having a fantastic program today. You know, we're talking about the environment, its impact on literature and the relationship between the two, the intrinsic relationship. We're having a fantastic conversation. Uh, Dr. Minaza, um, you know, you were also telling us about your critical involvement with critical thinking as well. Tell us about Asley. Yes, a critical thinking forum, which I just introduced that uh, among so many other social academic issue, one issue which has been its central focus was environment. Keeping uh, that central focus in mind after doing so many other things, this year we decided to carry on our next few years activities focusing on the environment and environmental related issues in Pakistan through literature. See, we are focusing on environmental humanities Mm. that uh, environment and literature, what is the relationship between them mm. and how it can promote conscious, uh, it can promote our efforts awareness. and it can raise the mm. awareness and consciousness of people in mm. Pakistan through reading and writing of literary text and through reading and writing the creative writings. So uh, this is, you can say that the present project of critical thinking forum and for, for this, we made a very systematic, uh, we have been making systematic efforts since 2015. Uh, I have been mm. writing and I have been sending the data, what we have been doing in Pakistan to mm. ASLE, which is uh, international organization, which is, that is association of the study of literature and uh, environment. Right. And uh, if you allow me, mm -hmm. I may read a little introduction of ASLE for, please, uh, please. you see, for our viewers and those who are interested. Mm. I have taken it from their website. Mm -hmm. They said that the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment seeks to inspire and promote intellectual work in the environmental humanities and arts. Our vision is an inclusive community whose members are committed to environmental research, education, literature, art, and service, environmental justice, and ecological sustainability. It was founded in 1992, and since then it has been working on all these areas very successfully. They have research journals, they have websites, organization, conferences, and classes, and you see courses. Yeah. ASLE has 13 chapters in the world mm -hmm. and I proposed and wrote on the behalf of Critical Thinking Forum, uh, I sent them a proposal for launching the 14th chapter of ASLE titled that ASLE Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, you see, two years effort was finally granted, uh, it mm -hmm. met its success, granted right. it was given success and it was approved, my proposal was unanimously approved by mm. ASLE's research board. And uh, Professor Slovit Scott, who is the founding president of uh, ASLE International, he visited Pakistan on 14, 15, and 16 of September this year. Mm -hmm. We organized a conference. Mm -hmm. In that conference, we launched ASLE Pakistan as a formal. So now we are formally, mm. uh, you see, affiliated. We are international affiliate of ASLE International. Mm. And our job is what we have been discussing for the last uh, half an hour or so, right. that how to make people mindful, how to make them aware that mm. what a beautiful connection exists between literature and the environment and how literary hu uh, humanities, literature and creative writings, mm. they can draw our attention to the environmental issues which are in Pakistan mm. and, and to make us mindful yeah. of the beauty, immense beauty which mm. is spread around us mm. so that we can benefit from it, not only in the material sense, but mm. also in the spiritual, emotional, and other senses. This would be the main job of ASLE Pakistan in connection with the ASLE International. Uh, and I think uh, people like you, and there were so many other writers. And I have contacted, I have made an advisory board consisting of 
20 people and they are scholars, educators, yes. writers, mm. uh, and members of the civil society, very mm. important lawyers mm. and other people mm. that look, we are going to form this. Would you like to be on our advisory board? And I think uh, I, I had received an overwhelming response from the people. People are more than happy to yes. join our efforts That's because so it cannot be individual's job oh, or no. a job of a few people. Mm. We need to have a collective and a sustained effort. And I think uh, all of us would be happy to contribute in as way without looking at material benefits. That's on other. So true. Because this is not only if there is a good environment and we are mindful of that, it's not my life but the future of our generations our as well. And you know the most important part is the preservation because there's the natural habitat, there's the yes. beauty that you know you're talking about and we're talking about. But then the looking forward, again your critical thinking comes into yes. play here. Uh, what are we doing for the future? It's so easy to live in the present and okay the future may um, consider, you know, an average person may consider a couple of months or whatever, but you know to think decades ahead Yes. and to actually think, as you said, what our generations are going to have, what are we handing down to them? Mm. Okay, now let's talk about the natural environment and the complexities of human relationships and how this all falls into place. Without, you see, being engaged in a very academic talk, let's talk about Islamabad. Mm see something that the complications in the environment and the complications of relationship between the humans and the environment. Mm. Islamabad in the last 25 years have drastically been changed. Yeah, the geography, mm. the landscape, it has been changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are happy mm. that uh, roads are being made mm. and uh, construction is being done. Mm. Perhaps we are facilitated mm. by all that. But again, but the balance that yes, you're mentioning, but the at the cost of what? So important. Yes, yes. at the cost of what? Mm. You see, I think uh, the heat waves which we are facing for, uh, we have been facing for the last few years, they are getting unbearable for us. Yes. And if we keep doing it, mm. perhaps it would be not possible for us to breathe in the summer. Mm. In even Islamabad, which was considered to be one of the most green mm. and the coldest cities, even during the summer. Mm. So when we make our urban planning, mm. you see, uh, one of the environmental issue is this uh, uh, unplanned, indisciplined urban sprawl, which is very much feature of the third world. And we see that urban sprawl is not only the feature of the other cities of Pakistan. Leave, mm. nobody is paying attention to them. But yeah, about, but the, about the Islamabad, yeah. which was so beautiful, mm. disciplined, well organized, the green belt and mm. the built environment. It was so much in harmony. Mm. So in the name of again mm. the same material development, we are, we are destroying that harmony and the balance. Mm. So why couldn't we have an urban planning mm. in which we could preserve the natural habitats, we could preserve the natural environment. Last year I was in California and I had a meeting with the environmentalist group and I was so happy to see because in California, you see it is a Silicon Valley and mm. the progress and all that, everything is going on. Mm. But they, they, you see the, uh, the natural habitats which were at the two different ends of the Los Angeles city. Mm. So they said that still there are some animals and their breed, it is in two places and because of the roads and the bridges which we have made, some of the animals are there and maybe the males are here then the females are there and the children are somewhere else. So how to connect them? And you see they are making the tunnels mm. underground, connecting the two natural habitants mm. which are at the two different parts of the city. Mm. The city life is going on there mm. but that natural habitats are still uh, connected. Right. Those brooks and the streams of water which were mm. flowing in the mountains, they are mm. flowing exactly the same way. So mm. the animals can go from this part of the place to that part of the place for all those purposes without being obstructed by the material development or which is being at all. done. So why can't we have any vision and ur vision of urban planning mm. which could be achieved without disturbing this balance? You know, we have always short, sorry, mm. we always have this short term planning that cutting the tree and wasting is easy and just to build the road. The but why can't be a harmony there? The word you use yeah. right now, yeah. vision. Vision, yeah. Again, critical thinking. Yes. You see, it's all coming into this um, circle. Hmm. And um, I would say it's a vicious cycle that we are stuck in. 
the urbanization, yes. the expansion, materialism, yes. running around in the rat race, being part of it, consciously or subconsciously, a person has that involvement. Mm -hmm. As you're saying, you know, it's so important to be mindful of the balance that we need yes. to create there and not to disturb our natural habitat that is a blessing yes. from the Almighty, actually. So what would you say are schools, because, you know, these are all those things that we need to nurture at a very young age. If it's not happening at home, it needs to be happening in yes. the schools as well. As an educationist, what do you suggest? What, what, what should children be involved in? Yes, thank you for asking this question. I think, unfortunately, like so many other problems, our school curriculum and education, and especially instructional uh, performances which we have in the classroom, civic education is missing. It might be in the books, in the documents of the curriculum, mm. but practically in classroom teachings, mm. in our instructional designs, civic education is simply missing. So perhaps mm, caring for the environment and the natural habitats around us and being clean and uh, being concerned with the good things around us is mm. the part of that civic education mm. which we are not doing in mm. our schools until our universities and if I don't want to quote examples and it, that our bad behavior, civic bad behavior is exhibited everywhere mm. where we go, even inside the educational institution. Mm. So I think uh, as an educator, I, I strongly recommend that uh, environmental education or concern for the environment should be the part of the civic education and they must be, if they are part of the curriculum, fine, they are there. But let us make our instructional design, pedagogical practices mean how to teach in the classroom. Mm. It doesn't matter I'm teaching literature, I'm teaching social studies, I'm teaching science, or I'm teaching any other subject. Mm. We can always talk about civic things and we can always talk about the environment. Mm. It is simply how a teacher bring or, or, or direct or the draw the focus mm. of his instructions mm. or, or of his students to mm. the things which are very important. Mm. For me as a teacher, okay, it is important to prepare them for the exam, but that's always my secondary purpose. As a teacher, my purpose has always been there, how to make them a holistic being, a exactly. mindful human being mm. who lives in a society in connection not only with the other human beings, but also with the physical environment. Mm. So when I teach literature, I'm lucky because I teach literature, I mm. teach poetry and these texts. Mm. So for me, this nature and the connection with the nature is always the central issue. I draw students' attention towards it. I make them to write on it, to read it, mm. to talk about it the mm. way we are talking today. So exactly. I talk with them exactly in the same way in the classes. And I think from our school till our university educational system, to this critical awareness of the social issues, including the environment, is extremely important. I must say extremely important. Mm. If we have been ignoring it, we cannot forgive ourselves. We can't afford it anymore. Yes, we, can't we cannot afford, to afford ignore anymore. this anymore. The things have reached to the peak yes. where we have to exactly. rethink and uh, redesign mm. our teaching, whatever we are doing in the classes. Absolutely. You know, uh, what you're saying is just it, it's so important because the power of a teacher yeah. often goes unnoticed. But especially when we're talking about younger children, they will tend to um, say and think that their teacher has the final word. Yes. Many times, you know, when my, when my children were younger and I used to say something to them, they used to say, no, no. no our teacher said this, so that was the priority. So, you know, teachers do hold such an yes. immense responsibility and power as well. One thing that I feel we need to, you know, drum into not just children, but our adults as well. Yes. When we're talking about nature, we're talking about the environment and protecting it, littering. Yes. The phenomenon and the, it's, again, it's the critical phenomenal. thinking and the mindset to be comfortable to just have some rubbish or, or, or a packing of something that you're eating, a packet of crisps or whatever, and the actual process of just
throwing it down on the ground outside and not giving it a second thought. Yes. Unless you are outside of the country and there you'll think twice and you'll look for a waste paper basket or a trash can and you'll go and throw it there. Yes. You'll walk those couple of feet. But you won't do that when you're in your own country and you can actually walk about and see uh, a, a waste paper basket somewhere or a, you know, a huge trash can somewhere where you can throw something. How do you defeat that attitude? I don't know how to change this mindset. You see, it reminded me, a few years back, I was at a Malaysian airport and a Pakistani woman with her a child, the child just threw that wrapper and she scolded him. She said, oh, it's not, I literally heard these words. Uh, it's not Pakistan, don't oh, throw it this that's way. So sad. The police is there. You see, it just hurt me so, so bad. So true. That if we are so careful about the other, because the fear which we had mm. there, mm. why can't we have love for the places where we live? I have observed that in the school, because the teachers are strict and they maintain the discipline, so there is no littering. The, the, the children are taught to use these bins. Mm. But when the students come to the colleges and the university where there is no such strict monitoring and discipline, mm. they come back to their self. Mm. They litter. They make mm. noise. Mm. So I think we need to be constantly engaged with them mm. for that, to Never. give them this civic sense. Yes. That to own your places, exactly. to own the space where you are standing and mm. you are living. I would extend this discussion that not only littering around, but the personal hygiene even. Yes. You see, we as Pakistani people, if you just go on the road and uh, leaving a few posh areas of our country, the general country, Pakistan, if you move around, you will say that people are not even mindful of their own personal hygiene. Personal hygiene, so cleanliness. This is uh, I'm saying. To the, the idea to be comfortable, to clean your own house, but then take that rubbish and deposit it in, some, in front of somebody else's house. Yes. You know, these are those things that get you thinking. Yes. And then we're always complaining about things that we can't do. Yeah. And this is something so simple. So simple. That I we can do. Yes, I think it needs a collective consciousness. All yes. of us, we should, we should know that what we are doing. Mm. Uh, I'm happy that uh, I, I have seen some efforts on the part of the government, cleanliness campaigns mm. and mm. other mm. things. It's good they are doing it. I'm happy. But how can this sense be taken to the grassroots level? Absolutely. You see, Perhaps this is the and work, I think it's as you rightly down pointed out, the, well. the work of the teachers, mm. maybe the work of the adults or the community organizations at the grassroots level. Mm. Uh, in our country, the issue is that this uh, littering and making noise and polluting the places, mm. it's not an issue actually. Yeah. People don't talk about it mm. and uh, they have meetings, they have their big things to do. They come, they do, they perform their job and nobody no notices that. So perhaps as a nation, our collective consciousness becomes so dull yes. and we have become so much uh, desensitized. We have desensitized ourselves or insensitive we are towards these things that we just don't notice, so it doesn't become issue. And I think programs like this, which you are doing today, I must appreciate these are the big efforts to make people aware and to sensitize people about these issues, mm. that these are not the little things. True. They are very important things mm. to do. And Dr. Melissa, you know, we also say a big thank you to you as well thank for coming so on the program and uh, talking about something that is so important. And, you know, I really hope that our viewers who are watching today, they can learn something. And as you said, critical thinking, it yes. all starts here. Yes. It's all in the mind. That is where your first step to progression yes. Yes. is going to take place because your thoughts do become your actions. So, Dr. Munaza, thank you very thank much you. for being here today and for you know shedding light and sharing so much information with us about something that we really need to be proactive about. And uh, you know we're running out of time, so a short message for our viewers. I think simply that it doesn't, it won't take anything from you if you just be mindful of the beauty which is spread around you, mindful in the sense that appreciate that it's beauty and take care of it because it's the most precious thing which God has given to you Absolutely. and it is free of cost, so just true. spread around you. Be mindful of that, protect it and love it. 
Wonderful, so. wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Munoz. And with that, we come to the end of today's program. I really enjoyed talking about, of course, you know, being a poet, so you love talking <laughs> about nature. And um, as Dr. Munoz said, it's so important to be able to preserve. To We enjoy beauty when we see it, but what about the preservation and taking care of it? And the most important thing is it's home, it's ours. We need to own it. So until next week, stay happy, stay blessed. Bye-bye. Thank you.